Well, good evening. My name is Monica Valentine, and I am a program specialist in the Library of Congress Informal Learning Office. I am joined on stage today by Gabriella Maitra, who served as a teen intern this summer with a focus on contributing to the National Book Festival. Gabriella is going to be my co-moderator today. We hope that you have all had a chance to enjoy the festival, and we want to give a special thank you to the sponsors of the National Book Festival. Now for what we're all here for. Jason Reynolds is a Kirkus Award winner, a Carnegie Medal winner, a two-time Walter Dean Myers Award winner, an NAACP Image Award winner, and the recipient of multiple Coretta Scott King Award honors. He's also the beloved 2020-2022 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Reynolds' many selling books included, many best-selling books, include All American Boys, co-written with Brendan Kiley, When I Was the Greatest, As Brave as You, Long Way Down, which received a Newbery Honor, a Prince Honor, and a Coretta Scott King Award Honor. He lives in Washington, D.C. Reynolds' latest work, Ain't Burned All the Bright, is a unique smash-up of art and text for teens. It's featured here today at the 2022 National Book Festival. The book is a collaboration with Jason's good friend of many years, Jason Griffin. I'm thrilled that we get to hear from Jason today about his time as the National Ambassador and about his latest book, which shares the story of a black family navigating through the convergence of a global pandemic and a period of racial awakening and social unrest. Please give a warm welcome to our National Ambassador mm -hmm. for Young People's Literature, Jason Reynolds. Hi, Jason. <laughs> How's your day at the festival been so far? It's been good. It's been good. I, I, got to, I got to share the main stage with some friends, Candace and, and Ebony, earlier. Got to do a signing for a few hours, which is always nice. And now I get to have this time with y'all. It's been good. It's been a solid festival for me. Great, great. Yeah. Well, we have been honored to have you serving as our National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Mm. The pandemic added a wrinkle in your plans to travel and meet young people in rural areas around the country. Yeah. Can you share with us a little about your early days as the ambassador and the virtual tour that you embarked on? I, you know what? When I decided to, when I accepted the, the offer to be the ambassador, it's like everything else that we do, right? For all of you who are teachers in the room, you remember that when you first became a teacher, you had all these plans and you, you were gonna save the world. And, you know, every, every, for all the pre-service teachers, like, you, sh you should feel this way, right? This is important. But, like, I felt like that. I felt like, yo, I, I knew what I wanted. I, I, anyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm intentional, I'm focused, I know exactly what I'm trying to do. Um, and this was no different. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I had planned. I, I believe that I saw where some of the holes were um, in the position, and I wanted to sort of figure out ways to solidify the, the appointment in a different way, or at least for myself. Um, and so I knew, like, I want to go to small towns. I want to serve under-resourced uh, middle America, for the most part, main street towns, just because I feel like, as a writer, I've been so fortunate to make things that have, that have grown their own legs and have moved around the world without me. But uh, these small towns aren't always on the, first, on, the, on the top of our list to go visit because it, because it requires us to sacrifice more, right? And it requires us to sometimes be a little uncomfortable. It requires us to bump up against people that we may, that we may share different belief systems with. Uh, you know, city life is a very particular thing. Yeah. And, and I wanted to make sure that I sent the message to the rest of the country that everybody's child is a valuable child despite where you live or what you have, or if there's a train or even a library, that like you deserve an author visit like everybody else. And that was the goal, right? And uh, the, the inauguration is in January. And I go on tour for Stamped in March. And in the middle of the tour, the country is shut down. Yep. Um, and everything sort of shifted because now I had to figure out what am I going to do to serve the young people of America in the way that I, that I plan to, which means the world to me. I don't, I mean, you know this about me, Monica. I don't take it lightly, 
I wouldn't have taken the position if I thought it was uh, a glorified award, if I thought it was sort of something that I could use for self-aggrandizement. I, I knew that like, this was a responsibility. And I wanted to serve within the, the context of the responsibility. But now everything has to shift because I can't go touch these kids. I can't show up to your town because can't nobody fly and, and everybody's sick, right? And it was a very complicated thing. So we go the, the digital route, the virtual route, um, which was hard but was necessary and still, and hopefully still made some sort of impact. I think it's difficult because there's nothing like human interaction, right? Whoever's gonna watch, the, whoever's watching this on YouTube right now does not know what it is to be in this room. They can't feel this energy, right? Despite the fact that they do get to get the information that might be being sort of disseminated, they can't feel human energy. Uh, and there's no energy more palpable than the energy of a child. So for me to sit on the screen and try to impart or impact a young person in a way that I wanted to required more energy for me because I'm trying to sort of be human with this screen in front of me, be human with this thing dividing us. But it was what we had, and we used what we had to, to, to do what we, what we had to do and what we could do, and I'm proud of it. I don't feel no kind of way. I think we did what needed to be done, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk out of my ambassadorship with my head held high, proud of, of the service um, that I was able to render. Awesome. I think you still managed to have an amazing impact on kids all over the country. So now, fast forward to 2022, and you have been able to meet young people face to face. Mm -hmm. I've often heard you say that when you spend time with them, you find out that the kids are all right. <laughs> the kids are all right. How are the kids doing after what's been a rough two and a half years or so? Well, the, the two and a half years was rough. And, and I don't want to ever treat children as if, they're any, as if they're any different than us, right? So if I were to ask everybody in here who is not a child, um, how was the pandemic for you? You would be like, it was rough. It's no different for them. It was rough, right? And they're dealing with uh, the shrapnel of that time, right? That's a real thing that I never want to sort of dismiss. I think young people really are trying to put it back together figure out where they are mentally and emotionally after being sort of siloed for two years. Um, that's complicated. There are parts, I mean, if you're a middle schooler, you've missed an important part of your development. And now you're trying to figure out what that means for me uh, as you enter into high school, but there's a gap. And in that gap is where we experience so much of our, that's, it's formative. Right. And they had to spend it staring at a computer screen, right? It's complicated for the teachers who had to do this. There's also a gap in your development. And we don't talk about this part. Right. But the truth is, is that something happened to all of us, not just the kids. If you're a teacher and you're trying to figure out what does it mean for me to teach through a screen now, there's something happening to you as well, right? And, and it's affecting sometimes even the way you feel about the thing you love so much, which is the art and joy and science uh, and, and vocation that is teaching. It's a real complicated thing. And so uh, having traveled and gone on tour in person with the young folks, a couple months ago, I realized that they are all right, not because they are not in pain or because they are not going through a healing process coming out of this or because they're trying to, or because, not because they're trying to figure out sort of mental spaces, illnesses, uh, and all the other things that come along with being locked in a home for two years. It's because they also are persistent uh, and, and, um, and resilient. Uh, and can always find a way to laugh, and, and, right? That is the beauty of, 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 of youth, is that there's always something there to laugh at. There's always something there to smile about. There's always something there to make light of. Um, and I think that's why I sort of try to stay around them as much as possible. But they in pain like everybody else. Right, right. They just dealing with it the way that they know to deal with it. And I, I hear a lot being talked about about playing educational catch up, but they're playing social catch up too. Everything, emotional catch up, yeah. right? everything. All right, so on to this book, um, Ain't Burned All the Bright, which shows us how one family survives the year 2020. Um, when a light was shed on racial disparities in the US and when we were wrestling with COVID-19. Can you talk a bit how you and Jason Griffin came up with the concept for this book and uh, a little about the process for your I, collaboration? You know, I, I, I was the strangest, um, 
I think that the strangest lie told about artists to artists, which also becomes a lie we tell ourselves, is that the art is the only thing that will be there for us no matter what. That is false. It's just not true. I think that's what we all learned. It wasn't there. The world shut down. COVID is happening. I've got personal stuff in my family going on in the midst of COVID. George Floyd is dead. People are in the street. We're having some semblance of what I guess we would call a racial reckoning, but that's debatable, right? But there is a moment happening in this, in this space. And I'm supposed to believe, right, that what, I was, what was supposed to be my crutch, what was supposed to be a thing that I could always fall back on, the thing that would never betray me, the thing that would never desert me, was this thing, right? My ability to form language, to tell stories, um, to use my voice, to use these 26 letters, to dig my way out of any grave dug for me. Right. And then there were no shovels anywhere near. I couldn't, I couldn't access or locate my language. I couldn't read. Most of you were in the same boat, right? It's like it's weird to be people who love literature, but you couldn't, you couldn't, it was hard to focus. You couldn't read. Reading requires concentration. How can I concentrate on anything when we're living at this particular time in a world where we're not sure what's going to, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my home? Is my baby going to go to school? How, is, should I go to the grocery store? If they deliver my food, should I wipe the bags down? Should I like all this, like, it was all this, you know what I mean? And yeah. I'm supposed to focus on a story. Um, so because of that, I, 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 I was sort of stagnant for a minute. For the first time in probably 20 years, I just couldn't find it. I was on the phone with Jason. Jason is one of my closest friends. I've known Jason since I was a 16 year old. We've lived together for, you know, an accumulation of probably half my adulthood. Um, in my early adulthood. And uh, we're both like these advocates for therapy. We're like the dudes, Jason therapy like three times a week. I don't know who needs that much therapy, but he, <laughs> he, he, he therapies a lot, you know what I mean? Lots of therapy for my man. And, and once a week, usually we get on the phone and, and we compare notes about therapy and about what we're working out, right? Um, as almost like a secondary form of therapy. Because everybody needs somebody they can that they can use as a vault, right? We all need, we all need a, a container to put some of the stuff in that, that, you know, I think we need a container that we know and I think we need a container that we don't know, which is why therapists are important, right? But I also think we need somebody that I know that I can give this to and hold this for me. And so the two of us were processing our, our experiences living through in the midst of uh, COVID. He's telling about his children and what he's going through with his kids and his wife and his family and all the things, right? We're talking about our fears. He's telling me that he can't find the thing that has saved his life all these years, which is his art. Um, but he said he had, he had been sketching sort of these random sketches in a moleskin notebook, and that to him, this has been sort of his oxygen mask. And in that moment, uh, on, on the phone, I realized that, that that language, the language I had not been able to access, that the words oxygen mask, that that, that is what I, was, that I had been looking for. Because that's really what it felt like. It felt like we were all being suffocated uh, physically and socially and mentally and emotionally, right? Like, like that all the air was being cut and that everything around us was sort of demonstrating, uh, demonstrating analogs of suffocation, whether it be George Floyd's death, which was a death by asphyxiation, right? whether it be COVID, which was at attacking the respiratory system of all human beings, uh, whether it be a strangulation of the economy whether it be the wildfires in LA, all of this is happening at the same time, yeah. right? And so I realized in this moment that it's oxygen that we're looking for, that it's a breath that we're looking for, right? And so in that moment, I realized that I had an idea and I, and I sort of told him I had to hang up the phone, I had to go work on this thing. And I, and I wrote three sentences and called him back and said, I think I, I, think I know what I wanna do. Because that's what Amber and the Bright is, it's just three sentences. Um, and that was, that was sort of how it happened. Yeah. Three sentences. So Three sentences. that's one of my questions. Rather than use a traditional format, you guys made some deliberate choices with this book. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's presented to us in three breaths. And uh, well, no, it is presented to us in three breaths. And as you said, it is essentially three long sentences. Can you yeah. tell us a little more about how and why you made those choices? So there's this idea, right, that if you're hyperventilating, 
if you feel like you're out of breath. And, the, and the, the argument varies between 10 and 3, right? But it usually, I mean, all of you who've been children, you remember your mother saying, you know, take, just take, take three deep breaths, right? If you take three deep breaths, it, it technically brings the body back to some semblance of, of equilibrium, right? This is old stuff, right? It's like, this is like yoga technique and like all sorts of meditation practices, it's right? This idea of taking three deep breaths is what will bring your body to some, some semblance of normalcy, right? So the book is sort of structured in three breaths as a way to say, like, at the end of this book, you should feel, hopefully, a little more even, right? That you come back to self, come back to the center, come back to, to you know, the idea that, come back to maybe just an, an inkling of hope, right? That you can breathe enough to find an inkling of hope, right? And so I wanted it to be three sentences to, to sort of mimic the three breath idea. But, but I understood that to write three sentences that are that long would put Jason in the jam when it came to making the art to respond to what I'd made. So I wrote the three sentences out and then I removed all the punctuation. And the reason I removed the punctuation because then it would give Jason, as an artist, free reign to communicate with this language and respond to this language however he wanted to without the hindrances of punctuation, which would then guide him through, right? If I punctuate it, he'll know where the, where the stops and pauses and he'll know. But if I don't punctuate it, he'll have to sort of suss that out himself and respond intuitively the way that he feels is necessary to respond. We both have to trust each other in this moment to make this thing. Um, and, and that's sort of how, so people think it's a poem because there's no punctuation, but it's actually, if you, I mean, the original, in, in my notebooks, it's three, just really three sentences that just are ridiculously punctuated to elongate them, right? Um, but, but they are written grammatically correct as three, uh, three long sentences. Cool, cool. Yeah, and that, that process, as you said, speaks to how well the two of you know each other and yeah, how much guy. you trust each other. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so one of the, our main character um, is wondering over and over again in this book why his mother won't just turn the channel. Yeah. As the media coverage of pandemic and protest is plowing, playing out, um, why is the mother unable to look away? I mean, why aren't any of us able to turn the channel? I mean, I think that like we have to, and I mean, my homeboy's in here and he been, he's like all into like media and politics and all this stuff. And he always, be, he, he challenges me to think about like, yo, it's a, it's a media loop that is being, um, and, and in this particular country, if you watch the media, if you watch news, which, we, which most of us do, you can pick which one you wanna watch, right? But, but, but all of them are, are being paid for because they all have commercials which means they're all funded, and if they're all funded, then they all have a bent, and if they all have a bent, then there's bias, and if there's bias, then, right, it's all, and that's just real stuff that we have to contend with in this particular country as it pertains to the news cycle, and it's this 24-hour sort of loop, right, that it's, it's like you, you, it's this treadmill of like doom, right, and the truth of the matter is, is like, all right, I know that we're in a bad way. I'm not sure it's healthy for me to subject myself to the, to the, to sort of this idea that it's going to continue to confirm what I already know, which is we in a bad way, right? right? I only need to hear that one time. Let me know when we're not in a bad way no more, right? Because, because, because my mind is precious. I, I have to treat my mind as something precious, and if, I wanna, and, if I, and if I wanna preserve it, then I have to protect it, and this isn't safe for, for me. Maybe for other people, you all are much stronger than I am. But for me, this ain't safe for me to continue to watch every couple of minutes them telling me that everybody is dying around me, right? I, I don't, and, and so it's this idea like, like and, and it's also speaking about the broader picture, right? It, yes, the pandemic, this is the first time in our lifetimes that we've seen something like it, maybe, because we did live through the AIDS epidemic, right? Which is funny how we only be talking about it, but like, that was a real thing, right? A serious thing that affected so many of us. We also lived through the crack epidemic. And, okay, so, so for me, so, so for me, so, so I recognize that like, I get it, right? This is a moment. But I also often wonder about, like, from a micro level, this makes sense, but from a macro level, there are other things, other conversations that we have that, are also, that have also been on constant loop that we also haven't been able to pull away from. Right? Conversations around race, conversations around 
around gender, conversations around, like there are isms everywhere, right? And we live in that loop uh, without ever figuring out how to actually do something, right? It's like, yo, I'm gonna keep watching the same, I'm just gonna keep living on the treadmill of my isms. I'm gonna keep being mad about it for a minute, motivated about it the next minute, mad about it the minute after that, motivated the minute after that, apathetic for a few days, back at it, right? Like, and it's like, yo, I'm just trying to figure out how we, I just want to turn the channel, not to avoid the thing, but to perhaps create new narrative. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, right? I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm wrestling with it, but I also feel like maybe we should wrestle more, but that requires, a, that requires us turning the channel sometimes. Um, I have to tell you, I related to the mother though, because I was the person in my house that wouldn't change the channel. You just was standing in the I was, and my mother I think, was as a mother, I felt like I was standing watch for my family. So. And, which is real, and, and, and who am I? And the thing is, I can't, there's nothing I can say to that. Yeah. Because my mother probably felt exactly. She's like, yo, I want to know every, every time a number go up or down, I need to make sure I know what time it is so I can tell your knucklehead behind not right. to go outside. <laughs> there you go. To, right? You, go. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, so I, and so that, but even that is a part of the conversation, like where you stand within that family dynamic or within mm -hmm. the, the structure of your communities. All of that's going to look different for, for what your responsibilities are. So that's real as well. And I want to honor that as well, for sure. All right, well, I have heard uh, you use another phrase I thought that was interesting, that it is an artist's job to consume the world. Yeah. Can you explain to us what that means for you, for other artists and writers, and how that applied when you were creating this book? I think that it's a misnomer, uh, not a misnomer, I think that it's, it's um, minimizing when people say, to write what you know, okay. not because it isn't true, but because, but because it's a statement that requires um, more. I think it's reductive. I don't think it's wrong, I just think it's reductive. I think that like, yes, write what you know or make what you know, which means you should know more. You should work to know more, right? If not, you're gonna run out real quick. You won't have that much to say. Right. Because we don't know that much. Right. Right? And so for me, I, when I talk about eating in the world, consuming the world, what I'm really saying is that it's necessary for the artist to live a curious life. The more arrows you have in your quiver, the more likely you are to hit the target. Right? That's how this works. And so for me, I look at my life as as just a cornucopia of experiences, right? Every single day is an opportunity for me to learn something I did not know, for me to meet someone I did not know, for me to hear something I've never heard, taste something I've never tasted, smell something I've never smelled, for me to try to put words to things that I've never had to put language to before. How do I code a thing that has not been coded, right? How do I change the way we've coded certain things to figure out is there a new way that we could look at the world around us? This is my job. If I'm not willing to be inquisitive about the world around me, including the world inside me, Right? I have to live an examined life, and one that is full of evaluation and consideration, one, one that is full of uh, discipline and accountability. All of that has to exist in me as I continue to move around the world and take in all that is happening around me. If I can't do both of those things, I will be stifled as an artist. I will be limited. And I personally just don't choose limitation. That ain't a part of my, that ain't, that ain't my bag, right, in general. Right? I'm going to do what I want to do, but in order to do what I want to do, I got to be open to everything around me, even if it makes me a little uncomfortable, even if it's against the things that I believe. I'm still interested in wrestling with it because then that will be some growth for me. And then I can really figure out who I am and how I actually feel about the world instead of being dictated to about who I am and how I feel about the world. Right. Right. That's all. Well, I didn't have this in my original questions, but I feel like I'm lacking if I don't ask you a little bit about Jason's artwork and how yeah. you feel about the gorgeous art that's in this book. Yeah, I, you know what? When it's all said and done, when my career is, is over one of these days, I hope people say, uh, beyond the stories, I hope, he, I hope they say that he had impeccable taste in his collaborators. <laughs> I, mean, I look at Brendan Kiley, I look at Raul III, I look at Jason Griffin, I look at Danica Nogodorov, who did the long way down graphic, right? I, I really feel super fortunate. I mean, I, I mean a, a true gift to have been in the company of some of our, some of, some of our, our current geniuses when it comes to, um, and, and, and Raul and Danica and Jason's, uh, you know, 
context when it comes to, to visual art. Jason Griffin, you know, I believe that soulmates um, don't always have to be romantic, and it's a shame that we only look at them that way. Also, it limits the amount of soulmates you can have. <laughs> the numbers are not on your side. We should open it up, right? Uh, and Jason Griffin is certainly one of my soulmates. It's a brother of mine. We, we have thought, we have debated. Jason is a, bl a blue-eyed, red-haired white boy <laughs> and whom, whom, whom I lay my life down for despite how much I love my people. Intrinsically, viscerally. But if he walks in the room, he is counted amongst. Not because he is, but because he might. Because he might, right? And, and that's, the way I, that's the way I feel about him and about anybody in my circle. And so when I look at what he did with the work, first of all, I'm not surprised. I've been around him for 20 odd years. Um, if anything, it just confirmed for the 50th time, 60th time, because we've been working together nonstop for years, that, that like, what a gift it is to know, um, what a gift it is to know a genius. What a gift it is to know someone whose brain works that way. All of those pieces in that book are written, they're all made this big in real life. They've been scanned in and blown up. They're in a moleskin that can fit in your back pocket. Wow. Yeah. I would have never guessed. I don't know. He literally made them. They're all pieces of tape and a little bit of marker and some spray paint. And they're all the size of it. They're all this big. Wow. Every single one. That's, that's different. He's a different kind of guy. <laughs> uh, and, and I feel grateful to know him. Yeah. And I wish he were here. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Well, I want to thank you for your thoughtful answers to those questions. Sure. Um, I have my co-moderator, Gabby, here, who's also been thinking deeply about this book. And I want to give her time to ask a few of her questions. And then we should have time for a few questions from the audience. For sure. Gabby, it's your show. Okay, so... We should give it up for you, I feel like. We should give it up for you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, you just spoke to how close you are with Jason and how long you guys have known each other. How did that affect the process of creating this project versus working alone or working with someone that you're not so close to? Oh, it's so much better. Because you don't got to do as much work. It's <laughs> the thing about writing, right? Writing is hard work. I always tell people, the reason why you'll never hear me trash anybody's book publicly, because even a bad book had to be written. And it's the writing of the thing that, that, that deserves applause, right? So I, I, um, to work with somebody, uh, especially somebody that you love and somebody that you know, it just makes it uh, just a much more pleasant experience. Writing, ain't, writing is like, it's a labor of love, heavy on the labor part. Right? It's, it's hard work and it's not always fun, but when you're doing it with your homeboy, uh, it definitely sort of lightens the load. You know? Also, it was three sentences. I got away on this one. I got it. <laughs> you know I mean? On this one, I, I, I snuck one in on him, you know? <laughs> but uh, you know, it ain't, nobody said that, that you know, your work was only sort of qualified by the amount of words. Right? I feel like I gave the words that were necessary to give, and my, and my, my brother picked up the slack and made it what it needed to be. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so speaking about the actual book, Fire plays a big role in it. Obviously, it's part of the title and on the cover, yeah. but also on the inside, um, in the art, mm -hmm. and through different, with the fever that the dad experiences um, in different moments in the book. What does that mean to you? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no clue. You know why? Because, because that's, that's Jason. We don't question each other's work. I say, this is what I made. And he says, and here's what I made. And then we say, okay, well, that's that. Let's turn it in and see what happens. We don't, right? And so if fire is what, so, so if, if I turned in these three sentences and something, and something implicitly, something back here in his mind was like, this is about fire. This requires fire. I have no say and I don't ask any questions. Um, he, he sort of makes what he makes. Because I, I don't want nobody getting in the way of what I'm doing. Right? I'm not a, I'm not a painter. I respect this man. I respect the work he's put in over the years to be as good as he is. And I trust that whatever he makes is what's honest for him in this moment. That's, that's what the process is about, right? That's what it really, this is, this is to me, uh, the greatest trust fall of all time. 
This is trust fall from, from, from a thousand story building, right? I, and I'm totally fine with falling knowing that he's gonna be there. I, I, we, no, no questions I ever asked. So I can't answer the, so, I'm, so I, it sounds flippant, but the truth is I can't answer the question because I honestly don't know. This is what he wanted to make. And my job is to say, okay, you know, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so this also wasn't in my questions that I had prepared, but something you said, just said, really stuck out, that trusting that he's honest in the moment. How do you stay honest with your work? With my work, I think um, there are lots of things I ask myself regularly. Number one is, uh, the first thing is always sort of asking myself about my, the love that I have for the people that I know will read this book, specifically young people, right? I know the book is read by a bunch of adults and, and everybody else, right? And that's cool. But I always am trying to figure out, it requires a constant check-in. You know, the dangers of success is that it can get a little messy, it can get a little muddy, and your intentions can sometimes blur. You can compromise things that you never thought you'd compromise. Because now, all of a sudden, you're trying to keep up with the success that you've garnered. And then what happens is you become exploitive to the people that you love the most, which in this case are these kids. If I ever make a thing that is void of love for the children in which I claim to be making it for, then it becomes exploitation, right? Because I know that they're gonna buy it because they love me, because we've built a rapport. Who am I to exploit the people who have built this life for me? Who am I to exploit the, the most vulnerable amongst us, the most human of the humans, right? So the first thing I do is I make sure that I stay steady I got a mother who's good about doing that. I got homeboys and, and, and people in my life who are very good about maintaining, about being a true north for me, right? Are you still, are you still is your integrity intact? Because it has to always be that first, right? After that, I think uh, it comes down to the work. I wanna be honest about what I wanna make in this particular time, um, what I wanna say in this particular time. I do not wanna teach any lessons. I do not want to be, I'm not a preacher. I don't want to sermonize or, or proselytize. I'm not interested in any of that. I just want to bear witness to the children of our country. But in order to do so, I have to make sure I see them. Right? And when I say see them, I mean that in every single way. See them physically, right? visually see them, but also like see them. Right? You feel me? Right? See them. And I think, I think if, I, if, if all of those things sort of stay on a level, then the work that I produce will, will be on the level. Not every book is going to be a hit, but every book will be honest, and every book I'll be able to stand on. And that matters to me more than any success or all the other stuff that comes with. Um, all right, we have about 10 minutes. Do we want to turn it over for audience questions? Yes, yes. Those are great questions that you had, Thank Gabby. You so You're right. It's time to take some questions from the audience. Um, why y'all only gave me a 45 minute session? <laughs> I feel like I did a session earlier, it was an hour, and then I come in here, y'all give me a 45 minute job. So yes, if you have a question, please step up to you the mic. You don't want to answer it? You don't want to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to talk to Dr. Hayden about that, okay. It's all good. Shout out to Dr. Um, Hayden. Dr. Hayden, I love you. I wish I could have seen you this time. So I, I also want to announce that if you uh, have a question but are not able to make it to the mic, there should be folks circulating around with pencil and paper. You can write down your question and give it to them. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Man, first of all, um, hello. Hello, brother. Hello. <laughs> a Long Way Down was the first book that made me break the first rule. So shout no out doubt. to, I shout out to that. Wow. Um, my first question, or it's kind of a plug, but also a question. No um, Cause I'm a, I'm a writer. I'll be releasing my first debut poetry book titled When You Get Older, sure. which is a love letter to my niece. And I basically um, tell the story of an uncle who has to navigate parental alienation and struggle to cope with not being able to emotionally bond with his niece because she's kept away from his family yeah. while watching his big brother fall apart. So I want to write. I'm also an engineer. And I just want to ask the question, early in your writing career, did you ever have to deal with the fear of the imagination you had for writing books? And what I mean by that is, I want to write. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's not the only thing I'm going to do in life, but I want to have more than 100 books by the end of my life. Yeah. That may be overambitious. A lot of but, books, my dear. <laughs> yeah, that may be, that may be overambitious, <laughs> and I'm not really 
uh, I'm not really attached to the number. I'm just no. attached to the process, sure, sure, attached sure. to being able to do that. Yeah. So, but the thought of it simultaneously scares me as well as motivates me. It scares um, you though, yeah? Yeah. So That's I wanted, good. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask how you deal with that because it even, you know, gets yeah. that shiver while yeah. we're talking about scared, it. Right scared, the fear, listen, man, I don't, if it scares you, that's, that's a good thing. I'll let you know that you're leaning into something that you should probably lean into. You know, I live by a rule, man. Like, if it, if it don't scare me, specifically as it, become, as it pertains to writing, I ain't willing to do it. Every story is a story that is a frightening story. Every story is a, is a story that I don't think I can, that I have the ability, let alone the time, to write. Um, and that's why I try. Uh, so live with the fear. Move with it. Let it be the driving force. Look, fear can, be, fear can be a propellant or a prison. It's up to you. That's on you, right? I can't, nothing I can do about that, I can't, right? But fear can work in both of those ways. It can be a propellant, right? Or it can be, it can be your prison. If you wanna do it, uh, instead of it, cause I know right now, you, I know you feel like that frenetic, you know, like when you think about it, it's like it do the thing, right? Your body turns up, right? You feel your body turn on, right? Cool, but you have to understand that it's more than emotionalism. Writing requires discipline. You're an engineer, I don't have to tell you about discipline, right? Because you had to be educated to be, a, you had to train to be an engineer, right? Which requires wild discipline. I went to school with all these cats, it was wild. I never saw them dudes, right? <laughs> Writing is also engineering. Requires almost, the, it, it's, it's an analog to engineering, right? You are doing very similar things, problem solving, building bridges. Right, it's the same, Facts. it's the same thing, which means it requires a similar discipline, right? Give yourself a little extra time in the morning or a little extra time at night. Just start, brother, just start, right? Really, you, want, you got a hundred books to write. So at the end of the day, you, know, at, 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 you, figure, you figure at the end of the day, if you can, if you can put a little bit on the page, every, create practice for yourself, yeah. a little bit every day, brick by brick, bro. That's it, there is no magic. But don't get caught up in the emotionalism because it feels wild, it feels both wildly intoxicating and absolutely, uh, like, ex like, I mean, like extraordinarily frightening simultaneously, right? This is jumping out of an airplane. Be caught up in all of that, right? Learn how to use a parachute. Learn how to under understand the, air the airplane. Learn how to understand the human body in suspended air. Learn how to like, do that, right? Get to, get to the minutia and the details and the discipline of the work and don't get caught up in the fact that you're about to jump out of a plane or you'll never do it. You feel me? Yeah, I got you. All right. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I think this is my family's luckiest year because we've got to be with you twice now. For sure. I appreciate so it. So my daughters um, participated in a conversation with you over at Hannah's for the Good. Good Morning America segment. Yeah. And I think we have a Calvert County connection. I graduated high school with Dimitri. That's my older sister. Yeah, and That's brother so strange. and brother <laughs> and brother Brookie Reynolds was my great grandmother's best friend. Which is my grandfather. Exactly. So all of you who read as brave as you, that is the man that is brave oh, as you is about. Okay. Wow. Yeah. wow. And a prayer ministry. And it's prayer, a absolutely. This is a wild experience I'm having right now. I, I, just, I just realized this, and your mother's name is Isabel, and my, my daughter's mother's name is Don't be telling people my mother's name. Bro. Oh, sorry. Well, you told no, me. I'm, I'm, you're good. I'm just joking. But, I'm, but So that's my question. It's, I'd love to hear you talk about your mother. And as a mother, a very mm -hmm. proud mother, I was wondering if you could tell us um, what's the one thing your mother said or did or made you feel like that made you the person that you are today? Oof, 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 oof. There's a I lot. I need your advice. I, my I, don't, I don't have, I, I won't be able to give you just one of those. And I'll give you okay. one, but it won't be just the one. But I'll give you one. First of all, my mother is, um, anyone who knows me, I mean, some of you I'm sure have heard this a million times, but if you ever see me talk, you know that my mother is like my best friend. What an amazing person. Always has been. I feel very fortunate. I feel like I hit the parental jackpot. My father was also an amazing man. God bless the day. He's no longer with us, but he was an incredible Dr. person. Reynolds. Incredible. Alan Reynolds. Yes, yes, I knew him as well. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is great. It's cool because not a lot of people, this is cool for me. I appreciate that. Um, my mom raised me in all sorts of interesting ways, uh, a lot of unconventional wisdom uh, that at the time she just thought was common sense. Uh, she had no problem breaking rules and, and making concessions when, when they didn't seem to apply 
when the rules didn't seem to apply to my life. It was like, okay, well then that ain't for you. We're gonna do something else. Very sort of simple. Um, and she was able to put her comfort to the side for the betterment of her child, and she suffered in silence because she knew that if I ever knew that she, that she disagreed or that she felt differently, I would change my mind. And she needed me to feel autonomous. She needed me to feel like I owned myself, right? And so if I said something to her that I honestly believed and she knew that it wasn't gonna be harmful for me, even if she vehemently disagreed, she would be like, okay, well then let's try this. And then she'd go into her room and like have a good cry, right? But in front of me, it was like, this is what we're doing because this is what you believe is right, and I can't see where it's wrong, so let's move in this direction because I need you to be able to stand firm in your decision making and your ability to reason, right? Now, I'll tell you this one thing, and then, because and then, I can go on about my mother, uh, so I won't do that. I remember being, my, my older brother and I, Alan II, uh, uh, when we were kids, we would, we, my mother would say, go outside and rake up the leaves and we would rake the leaves, but my neighbors had these other trees, right? So we would rake the leaves, rake the leaves, rake the leaves. And then she, my mom was very strict about chores. She was like, you gotta come, come get me so I can inspect, because I know my children. So I wanna inspect what you've done. And so we'd rake the leaves, and then we'd go to the door and say, mom, we done. And then in the, in, from the distance, from the door to the yard, the wind would blow neighbors' leaves into our <laughs> yard, right? And so we'd go to the door, mom, the leaves are up, mom would come to the door and say, I see leaves in the grass. And we would be like, I promise you, those are not our leaves. No leaves were in this grass. And she would say, well, I told you to rake the leaves, so you have to rake the leaves. So then we'd get to it again, and we'd rake the rest of the leaves up. We'd go back to the door. Same thing would happen. And it would happen over and over again. So the point that when you're like a little boy, you're like, this ain't fair. You, you making me do other people's work. You know, that. And her response, which I'll never forget, was, you have absolutely no control over the way the wind blows, and it's none of your business about what's happening in your neighbor's yard. You were tasked, and so your only job is to complete the task. That's it. What that looks like at this age is, I'm not, there's everybody crying and dealing with all it, and I get it, there are reasons. Reasons are real, excuses are full, I, I don't have, reasons are real, right? But I also, I don't have that switch that allows something to get in the way of the task at hand. When we talk about the ambassadorship, and it's like, I need a third year. Because, because not even COVID can get in the way of the task. I can't control all of that. What I can control is my intention and my discipline and my diligence, and nothing is getting in the way of that because of Isabel Reynolds. You feel me? Mm -hmm. One of many, many things. Shout out to the old lady. Thank you. Uh, my name's Tori Reynolds. Nice to meet you. What? Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to be a, a comic book writer when I grow up. Mm. And I was wondering, how do you give your writing such a personality so it's not cliche and similar to other people's? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I was having this conversation in a, in a previous session. You know what the one guarantee is, is that like, it's like, you know how they say like, thumb, like fingerprints, right? You got all these fingerprints and your fingerprints are only your fingerprints. So we could do everybody's fingerprints in the room and nobody's fingerprints are your fingerprints, right? You know what's wild about that? They connected to you, right? That's bugged out. It means that like inherently, you inherently are different than everybody else in the room. Literally, they're connected to your body, right? You were, and you were born with them. You were born that way. So the real question is always, how can I get back to the truest essence of me? In the midst of like going through high school, which is always the most complicated part because everything is sort of being layered on, right? The pressures of high school and the pressures of wanting to make sure that, that you have some sense of social standing within the microcosm of the high school, right? We all know how it goes. Uh, and the same happens in college too, right? All this weird, and then it happens in the workplace. Trust me, all of life is middle school, right? <laughs> all, all of life, right? It's, it's, it's the strangest thing. Strangest thing, but but what happens along but but what happens along the way is sometimes we sometimes we we put on so many masks that we don't remember what our faces feel like, mm -hmm. don't remember what we look like, what we sound like, mm -hmm. 
right? Everything feels a little awkward and we get used to the awkwardness and call it ourselves, right? But the truth of the matter is it ain't really who you are. I see kids walking around all the time and pretending to be gangsters, but like don't know that they look ridiculous. I know that ain't, I know that ain't you. <laughs> like I know that's not you, but you feel the pressure of the world, right? And so the real question about your, about your authenticity and your identity and how you stand apart has everything to do with how well you know yourself and how, and how courageous you are when it comes to your willingness of putting that that you, that version of you on the page, right? That takes courage, man, right? That takes courage, but I promise you it's easier to do that than to pretend to be somebody else. Now, you can emulate your heroes, it's important, right? It's an entryway in, but they only give you that entryway in so, so you can shake loose. It's your turn to cut your step, right? It's your turn to do your dance, but you have had to been practicing that dance, even if it's alone, right? Like you gotta be able to know your dance. You can do their dances, but when it's time to do your dance, you better know it. You gotta know your steps, right? And if you know your steps, I promise you, everybody will read it and be like, yo, he danced different than the rest of us. It's a real thing. Writing, don't ever forget this. Writing is about, it's about like, your personal relationship with yourself. That's why it's so hard to do it. Because don't nobody want to face themselves, family. <laughs> it hurts too bad. It's too uncomfortable. If you can get used to that, You'll have, an, you'll have a specific, identifiable voice that no one will ever be able to refute. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've got time for about two more questions. These are the last two. Yeah. All right, in the yellow shirt, you got the pressure is on. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I appreciate everything that you've ever said about banned books and yeah. kids who don't get access to the books and sure. the message that folks send with the kinds of books that they ban. Mm. And with Banned Books Week coming up in a couple of weeks, I feel like I see all of these very well-meaning organizations, bookstores, there are t-shirts and there are displays and there are all these things, but it feels like now we're just commercializing banned books but not doing anything about it. Mm. And mm. Like, where do you think that line is to really make change and not just make money off of it? I mean, I think it's, it's a good question. And there's an inevitability to that, right? Like, some of this is just inevitable in the way that the nature of us and what we do, right? I mean, we've done it with everything else, right? I mean, you know, every single hero we've ever loved is on a T-shirt, right? Somebody making money off of it. Um, but I also think that these things can exist simultaneously. I think, I think both of those things can be happening. I think that, you know, I don't have any, and it's tricky, right? I'm careful here because I don't have any say or know any more than anybody else. I don't, I'm not interested in pretending to, to have the answers because I don't have the answers, but I do know that like we get to pick and choose what we focus on. Now, we can focus on the fact that it's being commercialized and, and it's being sort of commodified and we could do all that, or we could also focus on all these teachers all these librarians who land their jobs on the line every day. I ain't worried about these profiteers. They don't matter enough, right? It don't bother me. And honestly, if they're making it more known and megaphoning it, so be it. Make your dollars. Make your dollars, right? I ain't worried about it. What I really want to focus on and figure out how to give some resource to are these teachers and these librarians, right? And we get to decide that. You and I and all of us get to pick and choose and decide what we actually want to give our energy. And that's where I choose to give my, that's where I'm asking you to give yours. You feel me? Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, we've got one final question. She's going to be like, what's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm an aspiring writer and an artist, and I just wanted to ask you, because I know, because I've read your books, and I admire how all of your characters seem real and different. Yeah. And I just wanted your advice on how to write characters that aren't like exactly as you. How do you write characters that are real people that are different from each other? You gotta know real people. That's it. I mean, you know, it's what I was saying earlier about a curious life. You know, part of that curiosity. I think when we hear curious life, we think about like experiences, right? Have you been to the Dominican Republic, right? It's like, have you ever been to, you ever been to Paris? You ain't been to Paris? Right? It's all this, it's all that kind of thing. And my thing is like, yeah, my, my question is, who are your friends? Because that tells me more about who, your ability to be expansive 
than all the places you've been. Who are your friends, right? Who are the people that you know in your life? Do they represent a mosaic, right, of, of this world? Are they sort of the patchwork quilt that you get to wrap yourself in? If, if all your friends are just like you, whew, life's gonna be pretty boring, right, and pretty stifled. But to create sort of a, a, a friendship circle, a family circle, where you celebrate everybody's quirks and idiosyncrasies and their differences, it'll allow you to pull from I write about my friend. I mean, like, I got a homeboy in here right now. He in all the books. You know what I mean? It's real. But because he's, because he's interesting. Because he's interesting, right? And I think do your best to be unafraid of the interesting ones, right? The weirdos is where it's at. You feel me? As long as they ain't harmful. As long as they're not harmful, it's okay for you to keep the weirdos closed. You probably a weirdo anyway, right? <laughs> And that's how it works. You're already good. That's all you got to do. Think about it that way. You feel me? Okay. Yeah. All right, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for that question. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I would like to thank all of you for attending the National Book Festival. And I want to let you know that if you didn't get to attend everything you wanted to see today, you can visit loc.gov later this month later this month to watch the events that you missed. Um, please help me thank Jason Reynolds for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.